coming where we're gonna go in four hours, don't you worry. Just put your hand on your belly, if you wouldn't mind. <clears throat> well done, team, great worship. Great, 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 great. It's not an outpouring, it's an upwelling. It's not an outpouring, it's an upwelling. <laughs> just let, let, let Jan just well, well up, it's all good. King Jesus, you've made your home in our hearts. That wasn't a casual decision, that was a super intentional, purposeful decision. I thank you that you're raising up a generation of believing believers, of laid down lovers, of men and women, young and old, from different backgrounds of society that are saying yes to your call. You haven't called us to be casual spectators, but radical, wild participators. And we give you thanks that in these times you are awakening the church. And we say, keep awakening the church. That's me. Lord, awaken Ryan. Awaken every single one of us to the beauty and the magnificence and the wonder of who you are, King Jesus. Lord, awaken us to the fact that there is no greater thing, no greater reality to live for than the glory of your name. Awaken us continuously to the reality that you have placed within us your wisdom and your genius to practically change society's issues. We say yes to your word. You're awakening us and delivering us from casual Sunday church attending cl country club Christianity where we tick the box on a Sunday morning at 9 a.m. when we walk in. But you are raising us up to be laid down lovers on Mission Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, all the way through to a Saturday, whether we win the rugby or not, you have called us and we are hearing your voice. And so we give you thanks for what you're doing in our midst, Lord. I, Lord, I want to stand here this morning and I want to stand on behalf of churches that I know in this region. Lord, even as I was driving here, blessing, blessing co-church. Lord, we bless Link. We bless Christ Church, Lord. We bless Church Alive. We bless all souls. Father, we bless the, the churches that meet, meet um, uh, Dan Mosiah, Father God, and Sharka's head. Lord, we bless Rivers, Lord, in the name of Jesus. We bless CRC. We bless uh, Leven de Wood. Lord, we bless the AGS. I think it's Leven de Wood anyway. Lichen Leven. Lord, we bless them. And every other church that I've forgotten, the Methodist church just up the drag here. Lord, those guys that meet with the cool lights right next to the freeway, we bless them in the name of Jesus. We pray for every local church to abound with the presence of King Jesus. We bless every local church, phrases, Lord, to erupt with radical laid down lovers, disciples of Jesus. Lord, we pray that the churches would be filled with seekers, desperate to know who Jesus is and filled with people who want to follow Jesus. Amen. Yes. Welcome to Freedom House. We have taken a decision to follow Jesus' lead, not our own. And so sometimes, hopefully most times, it's a little out of our control. You do not want to be a part of a church that is in any leader's control. As, as team leader here, my sole ambition is not to be in control of Freedom House. It's to be so free of myself to let God lead his church. That's a dangerous decision. I'm warning you, it's dangerous to be a part of a church that chooses Jesus to be king in every regard. It's very dangerous. But it's the kind of danger that changes the world. <laughs> and uh, Baz is absolutely correct. It's like, what did you say earlier? He said something that I just chuckled at when you described leadership in the church perfectly. Some people describe leadership as this, um, <clears throat> you know, modernist empirical cause and effect 
like playing pool, where you can scientifically figure out how to shoot the billiard ball, the pool ball, you know, to sink a ball in the corner pocket. That's not life. Have you noticed that life is not like playing pool? A book that we've been reading recently, it's Life is Like Herding Cats. <laughs> Stuff happens, isn't that true? And we think, we pretend, we dupe ourselves into believing that we are in control. But we are desperately not in control. And the more we learn to let go and allow God to, to teach us how to walk in rhythm and in step with Him, the better. So Jesus, once more, uh, we're not... We're not in this for four hours of worship or four hours of preaching. We are in this to glorify your name and to become like you. And so, Lord, whether we preach for four hours and people fall out and we have to raise them from the dead like Paul, or we have to worship for four hours, it's not really our issue. Our issue, our desire is to follow King Jesus. Have your way in us, in Jesus' name. Amen. So listen, um, we are, are repositioning our corporate prayer time. Welcome to Freedom House. My name's Ryan, and it's a real treat to have you. If you are here for the first time, best decision you've ever made. If you've come for the second time, equally good decision. <laughs> equally good, good decision. Welcome. It's a real treat to have you. Um, on Monday, the 12th of September, which means a week from tomorrow, we are praying here as a church corporately from 6 p.m. Come and join us. We're doing it once a month. So the month rhythm looks like this. The beginning of the month, the second Monday, the second week, we pray. The, sec the fourth Friday, we worship. We, we know, we try to respond to the word of God coming over the church globally, that prayer and worship are the most important things right now. And um, I know that it's a sacrifice. Yep, it is. Anything worth it in life is sac it requires sacrifice, isn't it true? You want a healthy marriage? Die to yourself, sir or ma'am. You want to raise kids that follow Jesus? You've got to bite your lip when you want to be in the flesh. Anybody else have to do that? It's about sacrifice. If you want to serve in society, you've got to lay down your life. Equally so, if we're going to see God do what only He can do, it's not the technology of the church. It's not the branding of the church. It's not the clever marketing of the church or the, the cool sermons. It is Jesus by His Spirit. And last time I checked, the primitive early church went from 120 in an upper room. And by the time Constantine came to power and did what he did, that's another discussion, 20 million Christians... It was illegal to be a Christian. You would lose your head. You would lose your business. They didn't have buildings. Not that we have a building, but they didn't have brick and mortar. They did not even have the scriptures as we have it, but they had something. Jesus King in his church. And a people who were just normal blokes and Bettys, just like you and me, fumbling and stumbling along. But their heart was obsessed with the glory of God and the good of humanity. That's why we live. So let's turn quickly before I get a little bit caught up in, in some other good things. Matthew 4 verse 19. The name of this morning's sermon title, it is a continuation of Matthew chapter 4 verse 19, which simply says this. Come, follow me, and I will make you fishes of humanity. Three C's. We the new 3CI. <laughs> we bless the Oaks in Pretoria. Come follow me, number one. Number two, and I will make you, number three, fishers of humanity. Christ, construction, and commission. The premise of what I said last week is this post pandemic craziness, a time of great upheaval, of the lifting of the lid and a reality, a stark reality check of what's going on in marriage, life, love, and the universe, politics, and economics, and the list goes on and on and on and on of what's really going on. People are rightfully taking stock. Yes, taking stock, which is encouraging. The warning that I felt God give me that I mentioned last week is that if this quality 
check, this taking stock, this reassessment and review does not happen within the all-encompassing embrace, number one, of Christ and His commission. We will reduce our lives and the gospel that we say, that we prescribe to, to ourselves, our needs, our longings, and our dreams. And it becomes a self-help gospel, the kind of gospel that tries to give you a better life, that teaches you and me to be the best version of ourselves. But that is not found in the scriptures. What's found in the scriptures is you and I being transformed into the likeness of Jesus. And so Matthew 4 verse 19 is an aligning sermon series of about three or four weeks to say God is doing deep stuff inside of us, assessing our marriages, reviewing our relationships, and the list goes on and on and on. But we are not being transformed into our personalities, our past, our preconceived ideas, our pretenses, our preferences, and any other P that you want to put on your hand. We are being transformed into the person of Jesus. Learning to be loved by Him and become like Him. And secondly, to love a broken world. Humanity optimizes itself when we live loved and we live for others. Let me say that again. We live most joyfully. Have you seen how happy people become when they realize that they are loved, 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 and they start pouring out that love for the sake of others? Humanity sinks into a pit of, of the lowest common denominator of humanity when we don't realize that we are so loved, not by a human love, not to get us on the cover of men's health with a, you know, a ripped six-pack, although that would be nice. But that is not the pinnacle of love. Having a bevy of beauties, gentlemen, you know, that you, you, you tick off as notches on your belt, and that's love. Or woman, whatever it may be. I'm a guy. I don't know how you think. I, I'm, I'm still discovering it after 20 and a half years of marriage. But the point is this. The world offers a view of love that is not love. It is a second, a third-hand love. But we live most optimally when we are loved by an eternal love that loves us in our mess. And a love that doesn't leave us in our mess, but lifts us out of our mess and projects us into a glorious future. And secondly, a love that says, guess what? You can be free of yourself. You don't have to run around sleeping around or lining up white lines and, and doing the next person in in business to get ahead. No. You don't have to live for your reputation anymore because you are loved. Suddenly, we are delivered of ourselves so that we can love others. And the true estimation of whether or not I am getting to grips with this great love of the Father towards me is how I begin to take my eyes off myself so that I can love other people. Come, follow me, and I will make you Fishes of humanity, Christ, construction, and commission. So, sermon title. This, this would actually be a good title for a book. The Beauty of Being Second, colon, Undoing the Rebellion of Genesis 3. Whew. Give me a couple of years and I might write it. The Beauty of Being Second undoing the rebellion of Genesis 3. I don't know about you, but I realized the other day in traffic, I have deep revelations in the traffic about myself. <laughs> I wanted to get first to the toll gate. And I just heard this little voice in my ear, Gertrude. Ryan, don't you just love being first? I do love being first. Love being first in the traffic? Anybody else want to be honest here? Yeah, die, yeah, yeah, speed. And I began to realize how my unsanctified propensity is to always being first. 
And how I'm beginning to realize after 28 years of working with Jesus that my best place, my sweet spot in life is not racing to the toll gate to get there or the toll booth to get ahead of anybody else. And now that we can free flow until the M4 is fixed, you know, it's just cruising in that my sweet spot is being second. So I want to speak about the beauty of being second. Come follow me, part two. I want to ask you a question. What do D.L. Moody, Adam and Eve, the spirit of the Antichrist, now I've got your attention, Anton Zandor Le Fay, don't Google it, and Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, have in common. I'm about to hopefully tell you today. Matthew 4, verse 19 expresses the kingdom architecture for our lives as believers for all of life. Matthew 4 verse 19 reveals the kingdom architecture. That's a Derek Morphew term for our lives as believers for all of life. Number one, Christ. There is, there is a divine order. Christ, personal and communal construction and commission. Those three things in no other order. Can you, can you notice that Jesus comes before mission? Can you see that? Can you see that following Jesus comes before having your behavior modified? Can you see that? Can you see that we are being made in the dust, in the slipstream of following Jesus? I want to reiterate this. What comes before a change of personality and decision making is this crazy thing called obedience. This is wild notion that there is one worth living for and I'm going to obey him. He doesn't say fix up your mess, Ryan, and then come follow me. He didn't stand next to Andrew and Peter and say, honestly, if you're going to become the oaks that change the world, you've got to stop swearing right now and stop smoking, text and play three packs a day and stop, you know, hitting your mates, okay, and stop going after the Romans. Stop it now. He doesn't say that. He just says, Wazani, the kingdom is calling. And they cry out. I learned a new word recently. Asambeni, if that's the right word. But hear this. When we, when we listen to these words, he's not asking you to get your stuff right. He's asking you first to obey. And in the process of stumbling, fumbling obedience, he, he puts his glorious creation-shaping hands into the deepest parts of who we are. And the next second, we look after our shoulder and all the stuff of our past is lying in our wake. So this is not a call to behavior modification, number one. And number two, it's not a call to be a good person and do good works. It's a call to obey the voice of Jesus. And we consequentially, sub subsequently start looking like him, thinking like him, and loving like him. I just want to make that very clear. But there is equally a divine order where we thrive the most. It is this kingdom architecture where we are in submission to Jesus, I and we will get to, and I will make you, it's less individualistic than you would realize, and there is another that's higher than us, others. When Jesus is the highest, and I'm underneath him, and others are just a little bit higher than me, and we serve them as a focus, that's our sweet spot. We wonder we wonder why the world is creaking under the weight of what it's creaking under. Imagine if the church became the shining example of putting Jesus first and others ahead of ourselves. Wow. Matthew 4.19 is the beginning of Jesus undoing the wicked, irrational rebellion of Genesis 3. I just want to underline that. It's irrational. Adam and Eve walking in the cool of the day in the beauty and the majesty of the glory of the Godhead. And what they did was crazy. I don't know if you agree with me. I'm going to have a chat to Adam. 
this, friends. Whilst Matthew 4.19 is the beginning of the undoing, it is ultimately achieved in Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. And guess what? How we live determines whether or not we enforce Matthew 4.19, the cross and the resurrection. How we live. If we live according to this divine order, this kingdom architecture, we participate with what Jesus began, destroying the rebellion of Genesis 3. And how do we do that? We do it by embracing the beauty of being second. Right, as, as we head into Genesis 3, I want to say this and I give kudos as I grab some water. I give kudos to Laura Nixon and uh, Ross and Laura's home group. She, she made this statement to me in the office this week. Jesus was not crucified for being a nice guy. Was Jesus crucified for raising people from the dead? Was Jesus crucified for healing lepers? For breaking down dividing walls and restoring women? Beginning to restore women to their rightful place in society? Was he? Was he crucified for that? No. It was because he went from town to town expressing his royal identity and proclaiming the good news that he is king. The reason why he was crucified was because he was declaring boldly in his words and his actions that he is king. And in so doing, he was summoning all things, human or other, to appropriately and radically readjust to the beauty and the supremacy and the ultimately satisfying kingship of Christ. That's why he was crucified. You don't put nice people on a cross. For Israel, for Israel, Jesus was dethroning the law the Mosaic law and works righteousness. Oh, they were getting upset, eh? That's why they put him on the cross. For the powers, Jesus came to dethrone the usurper, the Satan. And for Rome, Jesus was dethroning emperor worship. That's why they put him on the cross. Aside. I want to ask you this question as we jump in quickly to Genesis 3. What is the gospel of King Jesus dethroning today? I just want you to think about that. Okay, so what was the sin? This is a little bit intense here. What was the sin of Genesis 3? Was it an apple? Was it a peach? No. We need to go back to Genesis 1 and 2. There's a word that's repeated several times and culminates with a double emphasis. It's the word good. God creates, okay? And he says, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. And then he gets to the sixth day and he creates humanity and he stands back. And I can imagine the, the, the joyful grin on creator Father God's face, and he, he, he cries out, it's very good. It was a place of great pleasure and joy in Yahweh's heart, God the creator's heart. But he uses a word, he uses the word good. And the Hebrew view of the word good is primarily about function and not about mo morality and ethics. When we use the word good, Right now, we immediately attribute it to it ethics, kindness, niceness, walking grannies across the road, you know, letting people ahead of you in the traffic. The list goes on and on. But the original Hebrew understanding of the, of the Hebrew word good, tov, was about function. It's like, what's your favorite car, Nicholas Jack? A land cruiser. What is that? Is that a Toyota? Okay, I thought it might be a, um, a, a Land Rover or something like that. Just kidding, just kidding. Apparently, 
Toyota and Land Rover are at loggerheads with each other. So here Nick walks into a Toyota um, thingy where they have the cars. What's that called? A showroom. And there's a brand spanking new Land Cruiser for Nicholas. He gets in the car. Uh, do they even have keys in these new cars? Or he presses a button and it starts humming. All right, fabulous. And as he's driving off the showroom floor, suddenly noises and lights start going off. Emergency, emergency, because apparently in these new cars, they have these ladies' voices to tell you what to do. And they're telling you, emergency, emergency, emergency. Nick gets out the car. Oh, is that a Land Rover? Oh. <laughs> Nick gets out the car. He stands back and he goes, we've got a problem, Houston. This is not a good car. This is a bad car. Why was it being bad or not good? It was not functioning as it was made to function. But then Nick takes a big, bold decision and goes to Land Rover. And he walks onto the showroom floor and he gets into a beautiful brand spanking new Defender, I guess. A Range Rover. Yeah, Vogue. And he, Range Rover. And he gets in and he presses the button and the engine comes on and it just starts humming and purring as it should. And he drives off the showroom floor and he says, oh, this is a good car. This is way better than a Toyota. This is a good car. What is he saying? The car is functioning according to its design. That's what goodness means. And so when God looks back and he says, it's good, it's very good. Humanity and creation in its pristine form was functioning in its divine order and it was flourishing. It was abundant. It was overflowing. It was good. And so I want to say this. Good equals divine order equals right function equals goodness. Or shalom. Say shalom. Shalom is the God kind of life. In creation, prior to Genesis 3, shalom, the God kind of life. All because of good. Right function, divine order, shalom. Now Genesis 3, friends, I want to ask you a question. Genesis 3 reveals to us, if we could just quickly turn there, reveals to us, Someone who wanted to be first. Who was that? Yeah. The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals. I want you to know, uh, he wasn't a serpent. He was a shining, fiery one from the throne room of God. Okay? And there was someone in the Garden of Eden who wanted to be first. Let's read very briefly in Isaiah 14. Sorry, I just need to show you this. This is really important. Okay, the other text that's worth reading is uh, Ezekiel 28. There's some amazing things. Look at this. Isaiah 14, this is a, a, a double barrel prophetic word over a, a human ruler, but it's a window into the heart of the power, the ruling power through that earthly ruler. Take note, powers rule through humans. And so what Isaiah is see, seeing is a twofold layer. He's seeing the human uh, act actions of a, a faulty earthly leader, but he sees how it mimics the power manipulating it. And that power is Satan. How you have fallen, verse 12, from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn, you have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, look here, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne Above the stars of God, I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. And so here we see Satan slinks seductively into the garden of Eden, Genesis 3, and he asks a question, did God really say you must not eat from any tree? He's bringing Adam and Eve uh, in their minds, God's character into question, and he's setting their
them up. Because, as friends, sin doesn't just happen. There is a pathology, there is a process, there is a setting up to actions of, of sin. The woman said you may eat uh, fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. Look at this. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and that you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Two things. One, I want to ask you this question. Genesis 1, 26 through 28 says that you and I are the only creatures on the planet marked after his likeness. So the serpent, Satan, the deceiver, is not talking about Adam and Eve. Who's he talking about then? Himself. Satan is projecting his lustful, power-mongering disposition on Adam and Eve. He wanted to be like God. They were already image bearers of God. And so he slinks in and he projects his brokenness. All sin on humanity is a reflection of the evil one. If you want to know what Satan looks like, look at the plethora of sins, put it all together, times it by x to the power of n plus 1, exponential, and you'll have the devil. And how humanity partakes in that and takes on him and herself the likeness of the evil one through sin. But his sole ambition was to be above God because he wasn't made in the image of God. He wanted to be first and he projects his brokenness onto Adam and Eve. He also uses the deception that God has sold them short. He sold, uh, sells, sells them, excuse me, the deception that they are orphans lacking something. Were they lacking anything? Not a chance. All was theirs except death. He was protecting them from sin. And so there was one person in the garden who wanted to be first. And that was Satan. Very simple stuff. Let me tell you what D.L. Moody said when he was asked a question, if I may. D.L. Moody was one of the greatest preachers and, and church people of the last 150 years. And he was asked about his greatest challenge in ministry. Three times in response to this question, he said, nobody has troubled D.L. Moody more than D.L. Moody. This is, I, got, I heard my friend Wes speak about this recently and I asked him for these quotes. Secondly, he said this, I have had more trouble with myself than any other man. Thirdly, I have never met a man who has given me as much trouble as myself. <laughs> D.L. Moody. Isn't that quite remarkable? Now, what does D.L. Moody have to do with Anton Zandor Le Fay? Anton Zandor Le Fay, under inspiration of Satan himself, penned the satanic bible and the premise of the satanic bible is simply this do what thou wilt do whatever you want do whatever you want and so when we think of satanism sorry it's a bit a bit like we're getting a bit intense here when we think of Satanism, we think of sacrifices, we think of pentagrams, we think of black candles, we, we think of hooded figures, and we think of Baphomet, horned, goat, pan-like figure. But if you start doing any reading, and I would encourage you to do it very carefully, but the, the ultimate expression of Satanism is something called Luciferianism. And the essence and the single goal of Luciferianism is not that humanity would worship Baphomet, the, the embodiment of Satan, in a pentagram. The essence of Luciferianism is the worship of man, is the worship of self, is placing yourself 
at the center of all things. Now what does D.L. Moody, Anton Zandor Lafay, the Satanic Bible, and now the spirit of the Antichrist have to do with Adam and Eve in Matthew chapter 4, 19? The spirit of the Antichrist is not Bill Gates. It is not a vaccine. It is not a barcode. It is not a chip. Can I tell you what the spirit of the Antichrist is? Anti means against. You know what Christ means? Anointing. Maybe it means the spirit of the Antichrist equals I'm against the anointing. No. Mashiach, anointed son who is king. The Antichrist spirit is this sneaky seductive, serpentine, fiery, shining thought that weasels into the gardens of our lives. It jumps on our shoulder, whether left or right, and whispers in our ear, it's okay to be a virgin. The spirit of the Antichrist, friends, weasels into our lives and whispers, the gospel's all about you. It's all about your needs. It's all about making you a better you. It's all about elevating you so that the world must listen to you. It's all about you. That's the spirit of the Antichrist. And the spirit of the Antichrist doesn't lurk. Well, it does. L lurk in dodgy nightclubs and dens of iniquity, but it equally lurks in the plastic pews of local churches across the planet, slinking through all of us, whispering, Lauren, have you come before your husband? Glenn, Freedom House is all about serving your needs. Darth James, it's okay to be offended. You have a right to be offended. That's the spirit of the Antichrist. And he doesn't come with a scary mask and scare us witless. He seduces us and befriends us. Hey, Margie. And we feel so comfortable, comfortable in the presence of the spirit of the Antichrist because he loves us so much and wants to make us better at the expense of the glory of God, his gospel, and loving others in sacrificial love. That is the spirit of the Antichrist. I can sniff it in my life. He comes and he lurks. And every moment when something happens and I have a choice to be or not to be offended, to be the person with the loudest voice in the last statement, winning every argument. I used to love winning arguments. I'm going to fess up publicly. I was at the Natal University and I loved it. And I I was cornered by this um, person who believed in many gods, and I delighted in destroying his ideology. I delighted in it. I left him in a quandary because I'd read every single book, Baba Rodwell. I'd ev read every single book to catch the atheist and the agnostic. I, and I caught him, and I walked away so proud of myself that I got that ideology. And then the Lord said to me, who do you think you are? It's not about loving that person. That was all about you winning an argument. Spirit of the Antichrist. Really? Yes. Friends, 
Sadly, if Adam and Eve could partake of it, Adele, surely we can be seduced by it. The difference is the gracious forgiveness of King Jesus that forgives all of our sins. Thank goodness. Yes, but the seduction still remains. And the outcome was Adam and Eve partaking and badness, or should I say chaos and wickedness, but the, the opposite. Instead of good, it was bad. Instead of divine order, it was secular order. Instead of right function, it was dysfunction. Instead of goodness, there was wickedness. Instead of shalom, there was chaos. I find it quite hilarious that the secular um, mandate of the world is to, to elevate humanity in humanism uh, above all else, that we can do whatever we want to do, how we want to do it. But the outcome is chaos. It's amazing how God says, you have been made to thrive as my co-regents second. And all of humanity and all of creation will thrive. And yet, we have taken the pill. We have swallowed the bait and the hook. And we love being first. I'll close with this. Does this make sense? I'm just massaging the gospel here. Matthew 4. And then uh, we're going to, uh, Greg, you can actually get ready. Let me just read Matthew 4. I need a sip of water. Can you feel adjustments taking place? I can. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, God bless Freedom Kids, mighty ones. May they always be second. In Jesus' name. Verse 12, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Living, leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naph Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Oh my gosh, it was read this morning. I had no idea. Land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. Listen. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And the light comes and Jesus comes and he says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then suddenly he says, come follow me and I will make you. Isaiah 9, look at this. It's power. The people walking in the darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. And they rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders and the rod of the oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning. Look what was happening at one of the men's getaways. There was a realignment. There was stuff being burned that was encumbering because a light was shining. Why? Because the light of someone was beginning to break out. Let's read it. For to us, a child is born and to us, a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful. Counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Look at this. And of the greatness and the increase of His government and peace, there will be no end. And He will reign on David's throne. And the zeal of the Lord will accomplish it. Look at this. Light, adjustment, Jesus, King, peace. Matthew chapter 4. Light to the Gentiles. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Come follow me. He is the Son upon whose shoulders the rule and the reign and the government of all creation rests. And if we seek to find peace, shalom, it's only found in one place. In our marriage, it's found being second. Sir, I talk to you now in the name of Jesus. As long as you want to be first in your marriage, you will release chaos. Ma'am, 
I speak on behalf of my wife, if I may. If you seek to be first in marriage, you will release chaos. Young man, young woman, child in the family, if you seek to be first, you will release chaos. The only way is for God to be first and we choose to be second. How do we do that? I don't know other than one way. And that one way is worship. And so we're going to finish with worship.